Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Thank you for joining me and my guest speakers for this important conversation at this critical moment. We have actually been quite lucky in Bath compared to other people um, that our numbers, our infection numbers have been staying low all through the pandemic and are still comparatively low. So we are termed in, uh, as, as being tier one. But you know, things can, first of all, go quickly um, in the wrong direction, but also we need to really thank you, thank everybody who has made sure that our city has stayed safe so far. Education and the safety of our community touch each and every one of us. And education, like so many, many other, other aspects of our world, has changed dramatically. It has hit um, um, so many families, um, so many young people, almost everybody knows or is connected to somebody in education, be that as a, as a teacher, be that as a parent, be that as a, as a grandparent. So we are all um, ultimately in this together. As a former, former secondary school teacher, I understand very much um, the challenges of teaching. Uh, and not to mention now, I, I really um, think it is an extraordinary feat that um, education in our schools have been keeping going as they have. Um, and, and of course, our educators all play such an important role um, in, in the lives of our young people. Um, and it is, has been such an important priority for, for all of us to keep education going. Since March, my office has received hundreds of emails on uh, education related topics, particularly, of course, about the A-level results, um, but also about um, Marcus Rashford, Rashford's um, campaign about um, school meals. Um, and we all know that there's um, so much more um, that, that uh, covers the whole issue of education. We heard from students happy, unhappy about university fees. We heard from students unhappy about the fact that they um, still have to um, face um, high levels of rent even when they weren't um, being taught at university during, during the, the, the spring times. So there are so many issues and we probably can't cover them all today. Um, but it is um, a, it really a, a real privilege that tonight um, we've got speakers from all, um, all walks of our education system. If you wish, we have got um, Sue Adams from Round Hill Primary School, so that's a primary um, school sector. We've got um, Andy Grenoff from uh, um, our secondary schools um, uh, sector. We've got Bernie Morley from our university. We've got Kevin Guy from the council and we've got Francesco um, for, um, who speaks on behalf of um, our students um, because he's the president of the student union. So we've got a really illustrious panel tonight um, and I will introduce them all separately as they start speaking. So first up is Sue Adams, head teacher of Round Hill Primary School. Welcome, Sue. Very good to see you, and thank you for agreeing to Hello. speak to us. Um, please begin by setting the scene. What happened at your school when lockdown began, and how did you support your children and their families? Okay, well, back in March when uh, lockdown began at Round Hill, which is a two to 11 year old provision uh, in the southwest of Bath, um, I think it was the shock really that um, that got to us to begin with, having um, never been through this before. Um, we we uh, just went on to autopilot and, and followed government guidance. We, the first thing we did was uh, we had to uh, sort our staff into teams. We had to, um, uh, to put them on a rotor. Uh, we had to identify uh, the key worker children the children with um, additional needs, education and healthcare plans, and those in vulnerable families, um, so that we knew who we would be able to um, cater for uh, during the, the very end of term and through the Easter holiday. Um, I think one of the, the biggest challenges was sorting out um, free school meals. Uh, we have a high proportion of children in our school on free school meals, and it meant that we were delivering um, in the first two weeks um, up to 75 um, pack lunches a day and uh, that became unsustainable uh, and so luckily the voucher system came in um, 
which wasn't without its um, huge problems uh, all the way through the summer, really. It was a very um, clunky machine uh, and um, our, our, st our admin staff had to spend a lot of time um, trying to get it to work for all our families. Uh, I think we also had to obviously um, create risk assessments and we had to follow government guidance and uh, introduce things like the catch it, bin it, kill it. Uh, so we were out buying little bins for all our learning spaces, teaching the children um, how to um, cough and sneeze into their elbow from the very youngest all the way through um, and uh, hand washing routines and, and teaching hand washing songs. So um, in order tr to try and keep everybody as safe as possible in the little bubbles that we had um, at that time, it was very much about um, trying to keep them safe without um, panicking them and making them more anxious. Uh, we had to deal with um, anxiety in some of the children, anxiety in some of our families, and anxiety in some of our staff as well. We also had a, a, a quite a proportion of staff who were um, identified as clinically vulnerable. So that meant we had reduced staff numbers um, and that, that meant being quite creative in how we managed the groups. Um, we, it, we felt it was very important to support our families and to keep in touch with them as much as possible. So we had to set up new routines for um, phone calls and um, uh, keeping in touch with them by emails and weekly newsletters. Um, and then, of course, for those children who weren't able to come in, developing those home learning resources and trying to support families in delivering that education while they're at home. I think, I think um, it was, as everybody knows, uh, such a shock and such a strange time for everybody, but, but your um, ultimate goal is to try and reassure people and, and make those people who are in school as safe as possible um, and to keep in touch and, and keep people going who, who weren't able to come into school at that time. Well, thank you so much for sort of setting the scene. Um, and I think what we've all understood, of course, is that uh, you know, inequalities um, um, have been exacerbated um, through this pandemic. Um, but at the same time, you know, it, it's not just that. It, it, it's just keeping some sort of happiness going. I, if, if anything, primary schools are also there to to make learning fun, um, to have to keep the young people in good spirits, um, and that must have been really very difficult. Um, and, and I think we we all appreciate that. Is there is there any sort of example of what what you what you did actually for the sort of good times? Or um... well, I think um, the I think actually, if if we look back at that time, um, the children who were able to come into school actually had a lovely time because they were in um, small bubbles. They weren't in large class groups. Um, they had uh, a relatively high level of adult um, support. And of course, we were very fortunate with the weather. We did a lot of our learning outside at that time. Uh, and um, and it, it was a very creative curriculum that the children were able to experience. So, and, and the other thing we had, we, we, we did have um, some mixed age groups and I think the the older children definitely enjoyed um, at that time being able to um, access some of the resources and their learning opportunities with with the younger children. And as people say um, as much as Covid is difficult but there's some things that we can actually take forward as learning from the crisis and, and hopefully some positive experience as well that we can take forward. I mean I wish uh, we had more uh, adult to uh, young people, um, you know, a better proportionality and more no, more teachers in the classroom. I, I think it's just, there's just no doubt. Uh, it makes such a difference. It makes we had such a, a difference. 
We had a little girl um, who um, sadly has left us and, got, and returned with her family to China. But um, prior to um, lockdown, um, she was really str quite struggling. She was in the reception year. She was um, struggling with her language. When she was able to come back in um, Mar in June, in the um, when, when we got to that point, um, her being in that smaller bubble her language improved so much before she she had to leave at the end of term. Uh, so so there were some benefits and and staff reported that they enjoyed uh, working in different groups and in different parts of the school that they wouldn't normally have a chance to do. But well, one last question to you, Sue. Um, we had um, the big um, Black Lives Matter movement and you were very keen for your school to to respond and take part in that, what did you do? Well, I think I think we, we have a, a, a weekly briefing and uh, I think a lot of staff um, were very moved and upset and distressed and, and um, inspired by what came from um, the, the death of George Floyd, the, the actions that people were taking. And as a staff, we discussed it and felt that actually reflecting on our own practice at Round Hill, that there were things that we had developed, but things that we hadn't developed thoroughly enough and or deeply enough. And I think we felt that some things weren't intentionally tokenistic, but I think we felt with reflection that perhaps uh, we needed to, to take a real fresh look at this. We joined your webinar that you had back in the summer term and listening to the people on your panel then, it, it made us uh, really think we need to take some action as a school. So we set up a, an equality and diversity working party and uh, that um, comprises staff, parents and some community members. And uh, coming together, we, we come together every, every sort of um, four or five weeks and we look at um, where we are in the school, what we feel we need to change and improve um, across all, all aspects of diversity. And uh, we also have an equalities team at school and working together, we have, uh, we're building an action plan of the things that we need to develop. Um, and we're very keen to uh, work with other schools who are, who are taking that um, pathway. We're at the beginning, but we feel we're very excited about it. And, and, and that's great to hear. I, I think one, one always has to remember, yes, there's COVID, but there's other stuff going on um, and, and, and things that are here, here to stay or have, have been going on for such a long time. And you mustn't forget other things um, that matter. And, and it's, it's, it's great to, to hear that um, your school is, is really sort of taking a very proactive approach um, to Black Lives Matter. We, we from, from my team here have also tried to, to really sort of run with it and, and, and make a difference in our city. And I'm, I'm, I'm so pleased to hear that, that uh, your school is also taking part in that. So thanks very much, Sue. I'm sure there will be questions for you later on. But we are now moving on to to um, Andy Greenough, um, who is the head teacher for um, Ralph Allen School. Andy, very good to see you. Hello, thank you for coming. You're welcome, you thank have, you. you. You must have gone through a, a, a very similar process um, to Sue, although of course, um, secondary schools are very different, um, a different environment than primary schools. And I remember as a secondary school teacher that the, the, one of the biggest things was always to manage, you know, the transition from primary to secondary school. So that year group for them, it must have been, I assume, particularly difficult, but you needed to make things safe for everybody. And then you got the call that nobody wanted. What happened? Has everyone, everything gone to plan now? Um, what impact has this had on the day-to-day -day functioning of your school? Tell us a little bit more and give us an insight. Yeah, no problem. I, I was having flashbacks then as uh, Sue was speaking. <laughs> you just forget all these great things yeah. you've done since uh, since March. Um, yeah, so from, from the transition point of view, is it's a very crucial time. And they, they couldn't visit the school. So those groups of year sixes couldn't actually come in. So we... We filmed a virtual tour, which was a bit of fun with the students, showing them around. Um, we couldn't do our normal transition visit out, which is we go for a, a residential. So we, we just had to change what we did, and we actually did it in school. And actually, it's, 
we'll all probably find that some of the things we've done through lockdown, we might not change, we, they're better. So the residential, we held it in school, we did it so they got more contact with their own environment there. We did the same things, we give them hot chocolate at the end. So it, we're going to do it every year that way instead. Um, but they've just got themselves sort of four weeks in, loving it, enjoying it. Um, I describe them as um, a murmuration of starlings when the bell goes at lunchtime, when they just sprint for their bags and sprint to their lessons. It's, it's crazy, but funny. Um, and then we got the call. So we, uh, both Public Health England and Baines were very good. We, we consulted. It did take time though. So I phoned at 10 o'clock and I did get an answer at 20 past four that we had to um, close the next day, which is short notice for parents. Um, and then I think we, we've all learned so much since we started in March when no one knew what Zoom or Microsoft Teams what were. And now look at us, we're doing it all the time. So we were ready. We just, you know, you taught your normal lessons in school. And when you had a year seven lesson, you went online and you taught it online. Um, it was probably the worst year group we could have chosen because everyone else had more experience in teams. But we just showed a lot of patience in those first two days. And we had a lot of positive feedback. So the, the parents were, first of all, oh, no, we're going to lockdown again. And their experience was very much of the there's work and get on with it at your own pace. But they were very, you know, surprised and glad and that they just got their normal lessons. Um, we reduced them from one hour to 45 minutes to give them a bit of space at each time and give teachers the chance to log on and log off and teach in the meantime. Uh, but it, it couldn't have gone better, really. It, it worked very well. Um, remind me of the other three questions that you asked me, Vera. Well, um, the, 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 the tra transition, but, but yes, you've already covered, um, 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 you know, what was it like when you got the call? Uh, but but um, what interests me further further in is first of all mental health. Um, a lot of pe um, people talk about uh, young people's mental health, and as um, it goes on and on, um, and you know who knows what's going to happen. Uh, who knows whether you know we might have to go back to some form of lockdown. The toll um, on young people for whom you know a month is so much longer than for us um, oldies. Um, it, it must be just absolutely extraordinary. And, and the fact that they can't socialize, that they can't see yeah. their peers. How are you managing all of that? Well, it, it's no doubt about it that they, the students need to be in school. That social interaction talk, that was the isolation from their peers was the whole problem. Um, and th they couldn't wait to get back in actually and see each other. Uh, you, you had to keep them social distancing. That was that was the big issue. Um, but but they have to be in school. Um, what what we did is because obviously every single person is different. So we had a conversation for about fifteen minutes. We had a staggered uh, return after the summer, and we had a conversation with every student. We did questionnaires and we found out what it was like for them. Um, and then we've got different levels of support. So a lot of it, some of them are just happy to be back. They want their normal routines and get on with it, but others need more. So we're lucky that we've got four different counselors that we um, have in school and they've done either individual work or all the year sevens have had a workshops with 10 of them that's going through all this term. So it, it's something that they wanted to get back in the normality there. And then we're picking on the people who need that extra support to actually level them up again. But it, just the schools being open, for me, it has to stay as long as possible. And if it is a lockdown, let's just make it as short as we possibly can, because, you know, for their mental health, they need to be in. And, and, and how, did your, how did your staff actually manage what is now you know, being talked about a lot, um, the difference um, in, 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 in learning during lockdown. So some, some young people got on very well with it. For some of them, home learning has been a great experience. I mean, I, I think, my goodness, when I had my four children, if I had had my four children at home and had to home teach them, homeschool them, I know oh, they're a complete disaster. So how, how, how are they, how, how is your teaching staff now and coping with with all the different levels of where young people are, it must be a, it must be a nightmare. Yeah, <laughs> I think all the things that they said that, that that that's true. I mean, we had 
Um, we had people working out with IT. We we're getting computers out. We had the, the van, the minibus went round every week that gave them hard copies for the people and collected it for marking. So the things that you go to to try and do it. But inevitably, there are some students who actually thrived with their independence and actually it was fab. And then there are those that did very little. So that's where we know that we've got to cover the ground again and go over various things. And with, with the government actually extending the exams a little bit, um, we've actually got more time because you, we are going to have to revisit some of that material that was done independently for some. There's, there's no way around it. And, and, and going forward, particularly now with, with year 10s and 11s going into exams, um, on Monday we had a debate in Parliament um, that the government is now saying we are going back to full exams. And, and I actually made the call for saying, look, teacher assessment seems to have worked. Why can't we actually um, do that this year as well? Uh, I mean, I, I, I really believe we should trust teachers um, and, and teacher assessment works. And, and in fact, and what the Department of Education, it didn't work. Um, currently, the government is stuck with wanting to go back to exams. But to me, it seems as if, um, you know, with all that sort of disruptive, disrupted learning that might also go still be the case um, in the next six months. What's your thoughts on exams? What do you think? Um, well, I know how difficult this is for you to make decisions, but my two penny with is this is either can be worked, but giving us time to prepare will be the good thing. So if we are going to use the CAGs as we did before on teacher assessments, that's great. But tell us now so we all know the playing field that we're in. Um, don't tell us once it's finished or, or very close. Um, if, we, if we're going for exams, I think that's fine too. But what we're unsure is that what might happen in March again, et cetera, et cetera, and will it change? So it's the crystal ball is what, when it first started, it was the first two weeks were tough because I'm, I'm speaking to my staff at the end of the day. I go home and watch the news at five o'clock and Boris has said something different. And I'm like, okay, so we'll change that plan. And that happened every day for about two weeks. It's, it's the same. It's just, we can make each one work, but, tell us and stick to it and then we'll go on with it. I mean, it's difficult for everybody. And, and to be quite honest, I don't envy the government, um, but I have got lots of criticism for the government too. I think in many ways, I think they have underestimated the seriousness. So my thing would be, let's just plan for the worst case scenario and then stick to it, even if it gets better. Um, yeah. Um, and that what is, what, what is what I would say to, to Boris Johnson. So assuming, uh, you know, that things haven't really gone a lot better ne by, by next summer. So what would we do then? Um, and, and I mean, I still think um, teacher assessment is, is a good way forward. But hey, ho, yeah. the government is currently saying we are going and stick with national exams, but three weeks later. So I think if, if, if Boris Johnson was sitting here, would say, yeah, uh, Mr. Greener, what you're going to get is um, national exams, um, but with a three week delay. And then I don't really know how the exam boards are going to, to cope with all of that because they have got a very small time to assess. But hey ho, um, I hear your message. I'll take it back and make the decision now and then don't change it again. I think that's what I hear from you. Yes, yeah. thank you. That'd be great. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for sharing your experiences. But again, it's good to hear that people are positive and say, well, it was tough times, but it's also some positive experience. And I think yeah. that's what we all need. We need to, to hear that there's, there's also some positive things that come out of COVID. Let's move on. Um, we uh, now move on to, um, to uh, Bernie Morley from the University of Bath. It's so good to see you. Um, thank you for... Um, uh, so, so but, but first of all, sorry, uh, um, Bernie, you are the Deputy Vice-Chancellor and Provost of the University of Bath. Hello, good to see you too. Thank you for your time. Um, universities too have been through very, very tough times and have been in the news a lot. Uh, you know, it's a it, it very difficult balance and we, we do understand that universities and indeed the government wanted students to come back um, but as um, COVID cases are rising, a lot of it seems to be attached to the universities. And for me, the most important thing, to be quite honest, is to make sure that we don't get this division of um, students in, in the city who are welcome. Uh, I, I think they're bringing great life and vibrancy to our city. 
but if they're being seen as the people who are spreading the virus in 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 uh, in, in in our city whether that's fair or not uh, that is you know we have to avoid that at all costs and i think tonight too we would probably like to hear from you uh, you know what we can do in order to make sure that you know the university is really seen as as a driver of making sure our numbers stay as low as possible but tell us a little bit about your experiences your difficulties all of this conversation is about sort of everybody understanding well and um, where uh, uh, the, the other side is um, tell us about your planning tell us about your difficulties and tell us about you know how, how it was for you in the last six months thank you okay thanks Vera um, yeah I it, it's been it's been an interesting time I think uh, as as Andy and Sue have said we've also learned some some positives to take forward and I think we, we mustn't forget that but spent a lot of time over the summer planning and I think it was interesting talking about the exams because there was a big knock-on effect to us as well of constantly changing what was going to happen with the examinations and how they were going to be judged because we'd already done or we get the A-level results early before the uh, the students we'd already decided who could, could and couldn't get in based on their results and then suddenly the results were changed so we had to start again so I totally support what Andy was saying about it would be nice to have clarity that stays clarity uh, though admittedly moving the exams back will have an impact on us which hasn't really been discussed with us yet by our local universities minister um, so we spent a lot of time planning and I think the key message I'd like to get to everybody really is that that planning was based entirely around our responsibilities to keep our students and staff and visitors and the local community as safe as possible. So that planning involved making the campus as COVID secure as we could, making all our teaching spaces much smaller in the sense that where we had a 350 seat lecture theatre, it now holds about 50. So all those big events we had to scrap. Um, what we have done is tried to reduce the number of students who are on campus at any one time for our teaching. So uh, students come up for four hour sessions and they have one four hour session a week per group. So essentially they're only on campus for four hours a week for in-person teaching. So that's where staff are present. And I would also like to stress what Sue and Andy have said, and that is education is so important to our students and it's important to all our young people. And we have to make sure that, that it's there for them because if we don't, we really are disadvantaging a, a whole generation here. I mean, I'm both a, the deputy vice chancellor, but also a parent of, of kids who were locked down over the summer. And it was very difficult time. And my eldest is now doing his GCSE. Again, it's difficult if he doesn't get into school to see his teachers, he's learning more with teachers. And I think same for our students, they learn more with the staff there and able to interact with the staff and ask questions. Yes, they get an enormous amount online and we are providing uh, online live lectures and online live tutorials that they can take part in just like this. As, uh, as we were saying before, we've learned an enormous amount about how to use them in teams and we can use them for, for teaching now. And all of that's very positive, but that in-person interaction makes quite a big difference. So we've done an awful lot around that for our teachers. Uh, Bernie, you're suddenly on mute. I don't know why that happened. You must have touched something. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I didn't. I didn't know I touched anything. Oh, that was clever. So we are <laughs> good at Zoom, but we're not totally au fait with it yet. And that happens quite often. Um, so we've done, besides preparing everything for teaching, and I think one of the things there was making sure that our online offer was better than just here's a lecture that we recorded earlier, which we've done a lot of work on. But it was also very important to look at how we uh, helped our students deal with all the social interactions that they would have normally had, and many of which they couldn't have. And so we've, um, what we've done, and I think Franchi will talk a little bit more about this, is we've taken over our East car park as what we're calling the East Village. 
in there are a lot of uh, marquees and there are tables that students can reserve for groups of up to six and they can go there and socialize outdoors there are bars and what we've done is invite local um, businesses to come and service those bars so that we keep the businesses going um, the sports training village is open so it's there both for in-person sports activities and virtual activities and the edge is open for both virtual and in-person arts activities so we're trying to do as much as we possibly can to keep our students uh, happy and then if they have uh, the misfortune to go into isolation and we have quite a lot of students in isolation at the moment then what we've been doing is supporting them really well in isolation as well so they get meals delivered to them wednesday is pizza day sunday afternoon they had a hot roast delivered to them and our director of accommodation went round with the gravy to make sure that it was a proper roast um, they have all those exercises that they would get in the sports training village available online they've got mindfulness activities online and the student living ambassadors have developed quizzes so we had 59 households involved in a quiz over the weekend and the households the household groups can obviously interact together and what we've done as well because you know it's hard to be locked down in small rooms even if you've got a communal kitchen so We've set aside some parts of the campus as these are COVID secure and safe gardens, if you like. So households can come out one at a time under supervision and spend some time outdoors, and then they can go back indoors again. Everything's cleaned and another household can come out. So that sort of gives them a bit of, a bit of fresh air as well. So I hope that paints a picture of what we've been doing, but it's been a very busy time and our staff have been incredibly busy and, and absolutely brilliant. Thank you, Bernie. Um, I mean, it, it, it looks like um, a lot of thought has, has gone into um, the teaching, but I mean, we are all haunted by pictures of students sort of saying, we haven't, uh, you haven't got any food. And I did get the odd um, uh, uh, cry for help from parents. Um, and of course, if you're a first time parent of a university st um, student, you're also quite anxious um, and if you have a have a, a child, you know, a young person, um, a son, a daughter, uh, who is uh, suddenly in self isolate isolation and doesn't seem to get the food as it seemed to have happened, that is, uh, you know, that was stressful news to be quite honest. And and I hope um, all of, of those things ha have been sorted now. But but those are also the things that we are hearing. Uh, can you respond to that? I mean, we're about to talk to Fra Francesca, and maybe we, we hear from you also a little bit more about yeah. how. It be a student and I think we all have to rem remember that you know be be being a first-time student you know freshers you know all these expectations that young people have from their first first year at university is very very different this year isn't it yeah, so we haven't had the problems with the food that you've been seeing on the tv and I think I think you will have noticed that the University of Bath has not been mentioned there so all the students who are in uh, any sort of isolation are receiving food packages, all the ones in our accommodation on campus receiving food packages, which contain both uh, ready meals, but also fresh vegetables and fresh uh, healthy food so that they can prepare their own meals and the odd snack as well. And on Friday, they get a special, a special box which contains fresh ingredients, but also a surprise. Now, having not received one of these boxes, I'm not altogether sure what the surprises are. Maybe Franchi can enlighten us, but they are things to play with, games to take part in. They can borrow puzzles, they can borrow quizzes. And so actually we are, we've had quite a lot of feedback from parents that, that's been quite positive about the way we're looking after our students. So well, I, I remember only one, I, I, only one phone call from an MP from a, another constituent, the constituency who who talked to me that I think the son is a sports person, you know, big in yeah. sports. Uh, I, I think they need more calories and the, 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 the parcels that I understand was delivered to him didn't quite uh, satisfy his calorie need. So um, if right. we want to keep our sports people at, at, the, at the University of Bath going, and we know we are very good at a good sporting university, um, uh, remember that apparently they need a few more calories. Um, maybe right. can Back. I'll, um, I'll feed that back, but hopefully the, the not less than healthy snacks will have helped on that one. <laughs> very good. Thank you, Bernie. Well, we move to Francesca now, and I think it is very, very good to, to hear um, what it is like from the students' perspective. 
uh, you know, a very, very difficult year for certainly first time students. Um, we really need to be very mindful of that. I think the worst is always that you sort of you need to match expectations of a new reality. Um, and, and we all know that, that students um, first time away from home, there's all sorts of hazards, but there's also all sorts of um, expectations of having fun. Um, how, 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 do, how do particularly first year students manage all of that? And then we can later on maybe come also to you know, finance um, and, and, and the difficulties that, that some young people found themselves with not having a job to support um, their outgoings, um, but still having to pay um, uh, uh, so to support what comes in, but uh, the outgoings are still the same. So I had a lot of letters actually over the summer where students are very unhappy that they had to continue. They were stuck in, in rental agreements. Uh, yet they had moved home um, uh, many, many weeks beforehand and they couldn't um, uh, have their student jobs. And, and, and one of the problems is that students can't get universal credit. So they've mm -hmm. suddenly found themselves without a job, having to still pay um, a lot of money uh, without any opportunities for income. So, so those were the things that I heard particularly. But over to you, Francesco. Hi, uh, thank you for having me. So, of course, uh, the question here is uh, twofold, and one is concerning the incoming students, so uh, who we have under uh, practically our care on campus and in university owned halls, uh, and then the outgoing students who have uh, now graduated. Um, I'm going to address the outgoing students first because, well, I'm a recent graduate myself. Uh, I have this job for a year, and then off I go into the so-called real world and I feel those fears very deeply because it's a uh, it's a horrible economy to to get into a job to get into work into uh, so I fully share those concerns um, the issue of uh, students moving back home which they had to do over March but still had to pay uh, rent in the university on accommodation is an issue that we have tried to tackle uh, head on as a students union uh, together with the university actually in asking uh, landlords uh, in the city to uh, relieve students of their contracts because they were not occupying those re those um, residences anymore. Um, I know that uh, some of them were uh, successful and a lot of landlords actually comply with the request and relieve students of their contracts. A lot haven't uh, and that has put a lot of students in really, really difficult situations and it also has put a lot of pressure on the University Student Hardship Fund um, which is some a pot of money that uh, the student services department awards to students who experience financial hardship um, of course that's also paralleled with uh, the furlough scheme that uh, students at our university were able uh, to get thanks to the uh, decision made by the university um, it's also noteworthy to mention that uh, all students that were first years uh, at the time and had to go home were relieved of their contracts if they had to leave their halls uh, so uh, we were incredibly happy that the university was not a part of putting students into financial hardship as much as some landlords uh, within the, uh, the wider city and community um, had. Um, in terms of supporting those students now, students that, are, um, that cannot rely on part-time employment, graduates that cannot find a job, uh, our career service has upped uh, its capacity in order to support our students uh, and make sure they can find safe employment uh, even even though the situation is uh, is what it is. Um, I want to turn now on to the incoming students um, because these are all very valid questions and they were there are questions that were very much on top of our minds uh, as we headed into summer uh, and we started thinking what is what is the induction um, what is it was the induction what is quote unquote fresh as week going to look like because if we knew, it was going to be nothing like the freshest week that uh, that there used to be uh, and the freshest week that parents uh, and friends tell to their friends that are going to uni and so forth. Um, we were in a way lucky uh, to see what was happening to those institutions that were ahead of us. So we were able to see what was happening in Scottish universities and particularly in colleges in the United States. And we could see what um, young people at the end of the day, people that have been locked down for months, um, going to university, we saw what could happen if they were not provided a safe alternative. Uh, and that would be a massive spike in cases locally, uh, outbreaks, um, such as we've seen in Scotland and in the United States. We wanted to make sure that that did not happen uh, at Bath, which is why the SU worked uh, very closely with the university um, 
to create those safe spaces. So a number of marquees were erected uh, all around campus, uh, and that's for day activities such as uh, yoga, meditation, um, just like hangout spaces, people uh, where people can go in their groups of six uh, with a meal and eat and just hang out. Uh, the Students' Union proofed uh, its bar to make sure that it's COVID safe. Um, and again, everything is um, legally compliant and compliant with the university regulations. Uh, it's all table service. And of course, it has to abide by the 10 o'clock curfew. Uh, and just to go back to what Bernie mentioned before, um, the East Village was created. Uh, and again, that's a massive venue that uh, with all the social distancing and with the tables of six very well um, marked, uh, it can host around 600 people at capacity. Uh, and then we, and we brought uh, businesses to the uh, to campus to make sure they could provide that safe, but also fun alternative to students. Um, the, this is having quite a nice uh, take of students, both within freshers and with um, students from, um, from the local community, uh, which has been really, really helpful because it keeps students having fun in a safe environment and avoids them turning into very risky behaviors that would put their safety and that of the community at risk. Um, there are a lot of concerns that we still have, uh, and I fully understand that those concerns may be shared by uh, members of the wider community as well. Uh, of course, the, our primary concern, like Bernie mentioned, is that of uh, as the safety of the students, the staff and the wider community. Um, looking at our campus and looking at our incoming students, uh, there is a massive question about mental health uh, and how is this impacting uh, our students, particularly if we, if we move into tighter restrictions in the future, uh, particularly if, uh, according to recent um, media sources, uh, students will be locked down in halls before Christmas. Um, we are very aware and scared of the potential repercussions that this could, could have on mental health, uh, which is why we are doing everything we can to improve the student experience so that they can have a space where, uh, where to develop themselves in an uh, through the extracurricular activities and maintain a good uh, well-being. Uh, so those are the main things that I want to mention. Uh, thanks very much, um, Francesco. It, it, it's um, really good to hear from the students' perspective and also the difficulties. I, I think what, what I said um, at the very beginning is my, my big, big concern is that um, numbers of infections are going to rise. Um, and if we're not very careful, a lot of it will then be blamed on the universities. What's your thought around what can be done, what more can be done, how, how can we support the university, how can we support students and the message or whatever it is to make sure that we really, really, really don't get into that situation where uh, we get into tier, tier two, tier three, maybe, um, you know, and, and, and I think the, the main thing that um, we have heard tonight is that we need to keep our education institutions open. Otherwise, it's really such a difficult time. Um, but everybody can play their part. What yeah. can the students do? So um, the first thing that I, that I do want to mention is um, there is the odd uh, report here and there um, locally. Uh, but overwhelmingly, our students are abiding by the rules, uh, which is something that really, because uh, because sadly that is not heard very much, but a great majority of our students are actually sticking to the rules. Um, students are reporting when, um, when they're experiencing symptoms um, because, and that's partly because of the incredible support system that has been put in place by the university, students are sticking to isolation. And that's because what is provided to them means that they don't really need to leave because we're also providing them with an outdoor space and fresh air. We all know how important that is for people's mental health. Um, and the, so students are complying overwhelmingly. And I know that that uh, does not serve to reassure all of the doubts that people in the community might, ha might have. And really from the bottom of my heart, I want to say that we do hear those concerns and it, we are in no way shunning them. Um, the, our aim uh, as a student student, as a university, as an institution, is to make sure that our student community can live harmoniously uh, with the local community. Um, because of like various uh, events, uh, it may seem like there is this massive divide between students and the local community, and we're doing everything possible uh, to make sure uh, that students comply uh, and that we can live well within, a com within the community and as a collective get through this together. We, um, 
we cannot control the behavior of every single student. Uh, that is uh, practically impossible, but we are making sure that students are supported if they have to go into isolation, which is important. We have a solid disciplinary system in place if students do violate um, the, um, the health and safety regulations of the university or the law. Uh, and we are finding that a great majority of our students is actually complying compared to what we have seen nationally. Um, there is only so much uh, that can be done and I can really assure you that we're doing everything in our power uh, to keep all of our community safe. Well, thank you so much, Francesco. We are now coming to our final speaker, Councillor Kevin Guy, who's the cabinet member for, in, for Baines Council for Children's Services. Kevin, welcome. Good to see you. I think the last time we, we saw each other virtually was when we went to one of our children's uh, uh, support centres um, uh, in, the, in, in the winter. So that's a long time ago. Um, oh. We... Um, it, 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 I mean, you from the council, first of all, I think the council has done an absolutely amazing job. And I think across the country, people have understood that actually in the response to COVID, councils were, were absolutely vital um, and, and councils have actually gained in their reputation again across the country for what they, they did and they provided. Um, but you're seeing obviously a lot what is happening to children's services, um, to children and young people. Uh, what's um, your experience from the council? Just give us a bit of an insight, but also having heard everything today, um, uh, this evening about how we keep numbers down, maybe you can wrap up what, what you think needs to be done for us, you know, leaders um, of, of, of our local communities. Well, thank you, Vera, and thank you for hosting this event. Um, yes, some interesting questions there. Obviously, from a council perspective, we went into lockdown straight away and all of our meetings have been done via Zoom. So it's very strange for, for me not to be in a room with a load of other people making decisions by having to do it from my front room, which is an interesting shock. And as you can imagine, Baines did a really good job of diversifying its income stream. Uh, so heritage income and business income took a massive shock as soon as the lockdown happened. And we were in a situation where we were 56 million pounds adrift at one point uh, and we managed to get that back in hand now but obviously that has a huge impact on the services that we provide and um, particularly towards children's services because my budget along with adult uh, budget consists of 81 percent of all the income uh, of the council so that's a huge sum of money that we're spending on the most vulnerable children in, in our society but first of all it, it i think it's important that uh, um, we've got the head teachers and, and people from the university online here the government have done a lot of um, teacher bashing and a lot of teacher union bashing recently, but I'd like to thank the teachers and the support staff for all the a massive amounts of hard work they've done, particularly over the Easter period and the half term period, and the summer period, where they've all gone above and beyond, uh, and, and, I, and I think they don't get the praise that they, they definitely deserve. And we've also got the parents and the, and, and the students as well. They've, you know, had to make a uh, a once in a generation sacrifice. You know, children have not been asked to make such a sacrifice since the Second World War. Um, and, and obviously that leads on to points that have already been mentioned, which is to do with uh, mental health of children. And, and as my role as cabinet member, one of the key priorities that I've been uh, talking to officers about and to schools about is ensuring the mental health of the children in our borough is, is, is looked after. Uh, and as part of that, we, we have a, a new wellbeing service that uh, along with CAMS is providing uh, additional uh, training for teachers and, and that'll be uh, open to schools from next month. And we also are, are very um, aware of what Sue mentioned earlier, which was uh, about Black Lives Matters. Uh, and I know there is a, a, a live Zoom seminar tomorrow on, on that topic in particular. I'm very interested to hear from boys and girls in mind uh, about their experiences uh, and, and listening to the, the students and children themselves uh, and finding out what they would like us to do as an authority or what, what they would like us as teachers to do more as well. I think that's extremely crucial, listening to those kids. And, and as part of the lockdown period, obviously everyone was working from home. So we look after some of the most vulnerable children in society. So we made sure we got an extra 250 laptops, which doesn't sound a lot uh, for our most vulnerable children. We obviously made sure that thousands of additional school meals were, were sent out. And if any of our schools were, were struggling with that, we, we were there straight away to make sure that they got the help 
that they needed, particularly through the interesting transition period towards voucher system, which worked for some schools and didn't, uh, and didn't work for others. And then there's obviously an interesting point that both Bernie and Andy make about clarification. Uh, we've obviously found as an, an authority that rules will change by the hour of the government, and which is quite uh, difficult to deal with. Um, so I, I, I wrote to the Secretary of State yesterday with regards to exams uh, just for that, on that same point, asking for clarification, because our schools and our universities and our colleges can't plan unless they have clear instructions from central government. And I, I know it's a very difficult position they're in at the moment, but if I do have a criticism of, of, of government, it's their um, lack of clarification and, and they've been a little bit wishy-washy. And I'll, 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 leave, I'll leave it at that political point there, Vera. Um, thank you, um, uh, Kevin very interesting um, and also again a reminder how councils too um, and, and particularly Baines Council uh, is in a very difficult position because the council gets income for all, from all sorts of um, things that we couldn't do through the summer the, you know the, the whole of the, the culture and heritage sector was closed and um, you know the council after all gets a big parking income the council is also a landlord and all those income streams have suddenly gone uh, at the same time of course um, we have got more demand on services than ever before um, not least and, and this is always the most the more sad side of things you know children who are actually facing um, domestic violence um, you know these services particularly we need to keep going um, and we need to keep talking about it uh, I, I said earlier yes um, let's be positive but there are all, also um, particularly always really hard and difficult things to face. And, and that is, um, you know, how can we support young people who, who have been at, at home and where home is actually not a safe space? You know, we, we as, as you're aware of it, have a huge social worker team. And obviously when lockdown happened, it became very difficult for them to stay in contact with the most vulnerable children in, in, in our society. They, they reacted very, very well. Um, and I can safely say that uh, no children didn't get the, um, the, the help and guidance that they required during lockdown. Uh, one of the interesting things that, that popped up straight away was uh, children in, in Bath, it probably tells you a lot about the children in Bath, they missed their music lessons at school. So we made sure we set up a virtual online music school, which has been accessed by over 500 children locally, and that's a free service. Um, so that's one of the things we've done to help with mental health. But, but you're right that, you know, it's, it's a very difficult position that the council has been put in. A lot of our income stream has, has dried up, but it's imperative. Um, and I've made it, uh, and now this authority is in my portfolio's um, business to ensure that all of our children's health and well-being, particularly mental health and well-being, is looked after in these very difficult times. Before we um, open up to the um, general question and answer session, I want to ask each of you um, separately, what do you want me to do? I'm, I'm an opposition um, member of parliament, so I don't want to underplay my role, but I'm not running the government. Uh, but I can, you know, you know, ask questions, I can put pressure on. So if you had something for me to do, each of you, what would that be? Let's start with Sue. I think it would be to uh, help, uh, help the government to realise that having um, directives that change, we had so many different directives, we have information coming from them every day uh, that you have to keep up with, that is, uh, that keeps changing. I think that is very stressful and um, confusing. Uh, for leadership teams within schools. Uh, I think it, it is um, a, you know, a, a, a challenge to be supporting all the children and families and staff at this time. And you're constantly juggling lots of different aspects and to constantly be thinking, have I kept up with the, the, the most re recent um, directive from the government about this? How do I have to change my risk assessment for that? I think the, the constant changes has, has taken a real toll on people's well-being in, in the leadership roles in schools. I think that would be one message I would ask you to take back. Andy? Yeah, I think, I think Sue's right. I think I said clarity earlier, which would be great, decisions early to help us work with, but I think 
I think it's right. I've, I've spoken to a lot of head teachers and, you know, I'm from a, a mining village in the north. I'm not one to complain, but I am shattered. I haven't had much of a break since March. And it is, it's the, the it's wearing the time that we're going. But like everyone, we want schools to be open and we'll do what it takes. But I think that understanding is that the toll's quite heavy, you know. And for me to say that means that it is, because normally I'm just a, hey, roll your sleeve up, let's crack on. But yeah, just be aware. Okay. Bernie? Um, I think going back to some of the conversations about exams and changes, it wouldn't be a bad idea if they consulted a little bit with the, the, staff, the teachers and the universities about the implications of doing these things um, because they didn't last time and they haven't really this time. And the consultation that did go out about changes to things like A-levels, and here I'm talking both as a a university person, but also as a chair of, of governors and trustees of an academy trust, that we're not getting asked our opinion. And even if we are, it's largely ignored. It will be quite useful to, to sort of get some input from the people who are involved in these things. I mean, to make another political point, um, if I may, but, but, but that's been the criticism all along. And we now even know that um, the scientific advice has not been been really followed or taken and, and, and advisors advise and, and politicians make decisions but it, it, it seems that uh, communication um, I mean again it's difficult I, I, I get that I don't want to be uh, say, uh, be over critical but if you also listen to what has happened with council leaders in the government um, the the communication is just simply not there and people say well hang on we haven't even had that conversation so um, I mean, it, it would be interesting to understand the mechanisms of, 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 of communication that, that you're talking about, and, and, and maybe you have to take this offline, but, um, you know, how, how, how does it work in peacetime? How do universities communicate with government? How does it, does it work in peacetime? How, does, how do schools and academy trusts now communicate with Whitehall? I mean, where are these lines of communications normally? Um, do they need to be increased? Do they need to be refreshed? Um, is the government really sort of putting a, a finger into their ears or do they simply not have the, 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 the mechanisms for it? Um, and I'm, I'm happy to sort of, as I say, um, take that offline and maybe may, may, maybe communicate a little bit further with you after after this conversation. But um, let's go to Francesco. What do you think? What, 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 what would you expect of me? I think the, the one thing that has really been stressing me out uh, particularly in the last months of summer that I really want <clears throat> and I really want that voice to go across to the government is the situation has put uh, universities in the place where they pretty much have to reopen if they wanted to ensure financial stability and avoid mass redundancies students have to come back the government has been fostering a narrative whereby students have been made a scapegoat for pretty much anything uh, including the virus uh, even though they've been put in a pretty bleak position, uh, I would like for that to stop because it fosters uh, a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of like confusion, a lot of competition, a lot of hatred uh, between students and the local communities, the communities they inhabit when students, universities and students unions are trying their best to make sure that there can be one cohesive message uh, and that comes from the government. So there was one thing that I would like for to happen is for that narrative where students are at fault, no matter what they do, I would love for that to end. Okay, and Kevin? Thank you, Vera. Uh, uh, unfortunately, Francesco, uh, conservatives uh, often love somebody to blame uh, and, and the students and the teachers are the ones they're blaming at the moment. Uh, I, I think I, I go with communications. Being an ex-military person, Vera, I would say if, if a government are asking our public health team and our council leaders and our teachers, and our lecturers to enforce the rules that they're saying, they, their communications need to be a lot better. You can't expect people to jump instantly. Uh, it takes a lot of planning and preparation for schools and universities and colleges to make changes and they need that time to do that. Um, and obviously exams is a, is a very key point for you to take away, Vera. You know, there's plenty of time between now uh, and next June. 
And I think some sort of uh, a guided plan for maybe next Easter. We don't know what the, uh, the virus is going to be like next uh, exam period, but maybe we can have a set of protocols that say if the virus is this bad or it's in this state, then this is what your universities will be expected to do during the exam period and have those clear guidances well in advance of Easter next year. That's what I say. That's scenario planning. So yes. um, uh, uh, right, right. If, if it's this outcome, then we do this, or if it's this, we do that. Um, all right, okay, I'll take that back. Scenario planning, um, um, clear messages, not change um, things um, on a daily basis, not um, blame everything on students. Um, and uh, remember that uh, this crisis has taken a lot, a, 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 a big toll on, our, on the whole of the teaching profession and to remember that as well. I, I think I've got it here. Um, but as I say, I'm also happy to take um, some of what we've discussed here offline and, and discuss that further. But it's over to you now. Matt is going to now chair the question and answer session. Um, over to you, Matt. Thank you. Um, and I'm, I, I, I'm now taking myself off this conversation for the time being. OK, thank you very much. Yes, we've got a number of questions. I've had a number to me and there's a number in the chat box. Uh, so I think uh, first one here is probably for Sue. Um, how are your youngsters feeling now? One assumes that uh, the smallest children ad adapt very easily to a changing situation. Have they settled into a new normal or is there still a lot of anxiety? Well, I'm pleased to say they have settled really well into the new normal. We planned uh, during the summer, uh, end of summer for a recovery curriculum uh, and and anticipating that we would have, having not seen some of our year groups um, for you know, nearly six months, we, we anticipated um, considerable uh, mental health uh, issues and anxieties. But it's been great having the children back and seeing the families, albeit from a distance. Um, and uh, they have loved to be back, just like Andy said. They've, they've loved seeing each other, seeing their friends, being back in a routine, even a new routine, because we have to have separate playtime, staggered entrances, staggered um, uh, one one way systems, um, uh, separate. You know, it's it's very different. We can't have whole school assembly. We have to have it via Zoom. Uh, so it's a, it is a new normal, but I can honestly say they've settled. But they've they've. Um, I've been so impressed and really proud of them. They've coped really well. And those children who have, who have had specific difficulties, who, um, who had more anxiety back in the summer term than actually now, and, and some of them are coping really well now. And those who do still need that extra support, we have um, therapeutic services within our, our school that, that can pick that up and address that. Is that sort of... Uh... Okay, that sort of comes on to Alexander's question, uh, how are, and that's to you and Andy, how are the vulnerable children and their families with members vulnerable or extremely vulnerable to COVID-19 being supported at the moment? Are they offered the option of remote learning? Also, what are your views on the apparent lack of government support for vulnerable parents and children? Many are being forced to choose between their health and their children's education. Uh, Andy, do you want to start? And then... Yeah, I, th I think that that's, a very difficult thing is, you know, teachers have got some students in front of them, and if there's a child at home, they, they can't do both. So, you know, work has to be set, etc. But they, it's not the same experience. Um, we've been very lucky that the percentage of our students have stayed the same. And even when a year group went out, we were concerned about are the other children going to come in the next day? But but they did. Um, we also there is catch up funding available from the government and we bought um, computers for every student who doesn't have one through that catch up funding because it's not just actually we're learning online now so work's being set tonight it's been set to do at home online so they need that, those computers to, to divide that gap um, we've also employed a team a small team of people to work with individuals and take them out and catch them up uh, to support them where need be but yeah, I mean, it's a very hard as a parent if you think I'm not going to send my child in. That's a difficult thing because, yes, their education will not be the same. So do, do, do you suffer from a, a digital divide as well? 
we do, um, and we have um, surveyed parents to to sort of ascertain where the gaps are and, and what we can do. Uh, we do have a you know a significant number of families for whom uh, IT is is difficult, and especially if they've got several children in the family who all need the one iPad or tablet that's that's there. So we do have a small number of computers that we are preparing to use if if bubbles have to go into lockdown. Um, we also um, prepare as we did during the summer, but um, we are um, have learning online, but we also have resource packs of, of those of, uh, learning activities that we will either deliver or they can pick up should we go into a, a bubble, go into um, have to self-isolate. Um, but we, we do have um, a family support coordinator who works closely with our most vulnerable families. And, and she worked tirelessly through the Easter holiday, through the summer and through the summer holidays uh, and with agencies like uh, Southside and Action for Children um, and uh, Sporting Family Change. So um, she worked with them to get support for those most vulnerable families. Um, I have to say our attendance is the best it's ever been for um, the autumn term. So we're thrilled with that. So we, we haven't had any families who've decided not to send their children in um, because of shielding uh, other members of the family. So we haven't experienced that. Thank you. I've uh, got a question from Rosa and which ties into one, another one I've been sent is what has the university done to make halls and residences as COVID secure as teaching rooms, we already know that the problem for, of spreading of the virus is there rather than the lecture rooms, which also ties into another point somebody's raised. Um, there's a lot of private student accommodation in Bath plus HMOs. Um, how much influence do you actually have in terms of keeping these spaces safe? Uh, uh, Shai, can we start with Bernie? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. I mean, we've we've what we've done is uh, all our households are divided into so bubbles of households of sort of eight or ten or up to twenty based around kitchen units. So those are sort of according to government guidelines, we can treat those as like a family. Um, and so that has been the first step in doing that. Obviously, everything is kept as clean as possible. Um, students are there's one way systems in all of the accommodation, just like there is in, across the university. Um, and we have uh, our security are, are around 24 hours a day on campus. We've employed extra security staff. And as Francia uh, alluded to, we have been um, very positive with the, the Be Safe campaign with the students, but equally if people are not following what we're asking them to do, then there are uh, disciplinary steps that we can take and, and have had on, to be fair, very few occasions had to follow. Um, and, and actually, I think I would also like to highlight how responsible the students are being. And the same goes for the ones in HMOs. We're in contact with them. Our security staff also go around the city. And interestingly, just to sort of put some color on that, I was on a call today with the uh, the Baines Outbreak Engagement Board and the uh, the police representative was saying how in the Bath area they haven't been called to any student incidents and that is comparing very favorably with his colleagues in the southwest that are as far as he was concerned our students have been behaving really well from the point of view of keeping self-isolating uh, and if needed but also only going around in small groups and not having large parties. And, uh, you know, so I think we have to rely to some extent on their, them being responsible adults. They are adults now and they have been behaving that way. But obviously on campus, we have a eye on them. Um, and in the HMOs, we're in constant touch with them. Francesca, is that uh, your experience? Are you able to reach into these private uh, 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 student accommodations or houses of multiple occupations, sorry, I should say. So the question, <clears throat> the question here is about off campus, so like non university owned halls. Um, yeah, well, I, uh, I still have a few friends uh, that do live in Bath and do study in Bath. 
uh, and leave in HMOs. Um, of course, like the university cannot do, can apply the same, um, the same rules that it could apply in, in halls because, well, it's different structures. Uh, and also, uh, it's not just students that live in HMOs, uh, they're also for rent for young professionals uh, and, and other people. Um, but the level of uh, secu the level of uh, contact from the university and the support from the university in cases of self isolation has been stunning, uh, and I don't know this from any personal experience because uh, I don't have any friends who had to go through that. But from the reports that we see and what we have received, and the confirmation today that our students in HMOs are respecting uh, lockdowns, um, isolation, sorry, uh, means that clearly something is being uh, done right. Uh, particularly if the police has not been called to any student incidents, that's that's pretty good compared to what we have seen nationally. Yeah, because I certainly, um, people have certainly said to me, uh, you, know, you know, a lot of Bath's pavements are very narrow uh, and it, uh, some of the older residents are saying, you know, it can be quite intimidating when you suddenly see five or six young people occupying the whole pavement. Uh, and whilst the rest of us have had the, the practice of giving each other uh, two meters or passing each other at a safe distance that actually this is a new experience for a lot of uh, young people uh, and uh, people are feeling anxious um, but Tim Tim's asked a very uh, straightforward question um, how many uh, sort of staff or students have tested positive uh, and how many in in self-isolation in their respective institutions I don't know if uh, you have all those figures so to start with you have, have you had any positive test results amongst your staff or students no uh, no not uh, not yet yes not uh, yet um, I'm, I'm touching wood so um, I'm hoping that we don't we, we have had um, I think three uh, support staff who've who've had to isolate until somebody they knew test results came through uh, and uh, or a member of their family um, but uh, that's since March so we've been very fortunate we haven't been affected yet. Okay Andy you've obviously had the one confirmation that sent the whole year group home but is, is it still just at the one? Yeah just the one and we've had um, a couple who've had to get tests and been off for a couple of days but not positive and we have one um, member of staff who were told by the test and trace app that they had to isolate for two weeks uh, but they have shown no symptoms. Uh, Bernie what about the university? Uh, you're getting you're getting students from all over the country suddenly arriving. Yeah, well all obviously over. we've had a few more than that. Uh, I did type a response to Tim because all our daily statistics are, are, are visible are available on the website so you can just type into the University of Bath and look on COVID and there are how many cases are coming through each day. Okay. Um, it it at the moment. Well, so so today we had nine positive cases. We've had so far altogether, I think. Um, actually, off the top of my head, I don't know, but it's over a hundred positive cases. They aren't in the in the, as classified by public health authorities as an outbreak because these are spread over a large number of the households on campus uh, and in town, and that's why there are quite a lot of people isolating because there's one individual who's tested positive in that group um, so it's difficult to say exactly where the where the transmission is taking place but we know it doesn't appear to be uh, on campus in the teaching um, the the good news is that they seem to have leveled out and coming down a little bit though this is you know one day so we we've been what looking at the seven day rolling average as they do on on the news and that seems to have leveled out as well and come down a little bit so there was initial increase when everybody arrived then it's gone down a bit okay thank you just moving on to some of the comments talking about uh say early on particularly um uh, schools giving parents conflicting um uh, uh requests uh, to-do lists um uh is that to do, do you think that's to do with um, the schools getting different requests from government? Because certainly now you've, I think, Andy, you've alluded to the fact that you've got quite a lot of catch up to do, despite some of the children uh, doing a lot of work as instructed during lockdown. Um, is that is that from those comments, is that, do you recognise that? 
Yeah, I, th I think that, you know, we, 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 I saw the initial comment as well. It's about, this is brand new for everyone. You know, they, they use this, uh, these times that were unprecedented and, and it was, we didn't have a clue when we first started. We didn't know how long it would last. We were doing things for that last for a week and then two weeks and now after Easter we're back in, et cetera. And, you know, staff weren't in, they had no team on, no training on teams. It was very difficult. And I think that uh, what they're saying is, yes, some people have covered it, some people haven't, but those who haven't will have to do it. It's not we're going to make them all do it again. But, yeah, it's there's a friend of mine I play football with, and he said that one of his schools said this. They said that um, we're not doing online teaching because not everyone can do it. And he said, quite frankly, he says, that doesn't, why does that affect me? My child's got a computer, they can get on with it. Why can't because of that? And, and I could see that point of view. But it, it is, it's basically, we will do it. And for those that can't, we will find another method to support those additionally, not hold everyone back or other people that have done it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, uh, I, I certainly know that from my own point of view, my, my daughter flatly refused to do anything that looked like schoolwork for six months basically having to come up with cunning plans to make it not look like school work um uh moving on uh, i've got one here um for the uh, let's go for francesco first the uh, town gown divide is is growing across the country how can you ease those pressures here in bath without the usual activities that students might get involved with like volunteering and community work the sorts of things you're not allowed to do now in terms of group activities. How 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 are how is the student union facing that that relationship with residents? Well, the first thing is that um, is to to remember what happened during the months of lockdown and how a lot of students and um, staff members uh, as well. And I would like particularly want to particularly highlight a staff member within the students union that received a commendation for his work with the local community. A lot of students mobilised. Uh, to support the COVID relief relief effort uh, in Bath. Uh, so yes, a lot of the traditional volunteering activities cannot happen, but uh, a lot of students have been incredibly resourceful uh, to, uh, to support themselves, yes, but the wider community as well th throughout lockdown. Uh, and it's important we remember that when those stories come on the press uh, and we think the divide is larger more than ever, actually in a lot of ways, um, the, the community has never been tighter as it was uh, during the months of COVID. Um, looking, looking ahead, uh, our volunteering groups are trying to uh, completely reshape the activity that they do to deliver a lot of things online. Uh, I know that um, one of our student groups is, organi is organizing a, a, perform a virtual performance um, for local students uh, as they have done, uh, done in the past. So uh, our students are bright and they are resourceful. Uh, and they're doing everything possible um, in order to make sure that they can keep contributing as they have done in the past. Um, of course, the situation is trickier now than, than, it, was, um, than it was before COVID happened. Um, however, there is a lot of, of risk with everything that, that has been done, but there's also a lot of possibility. Uh, and if we all keep doing our bit, we could actually get through this thing and get out of it in a stronger position than we were before. Yeah, I think I've been asked to mention um, that uh, Bain's 3SG. Do you do you work yes. closely with the third sector group so you can feed, you can direct students who want to do something towards that? Especially if we, if heaven forbid, we end up in a in a yeah. uh, whatever phase two or whatever it is, or I can't remember what it's called now. Um, but uh, yeah, so you're aware of you're aware of that. Yeah, um, one of um, it was one of our staff members that led that initiative. So. Okay. Good. Closing ball with that. Good, good. Um, uh, I've got a question from Cameron, uh, uh, which it highlights the uh, the um, differences uh, um, between Bath Spa with eleven cases and Bath University of Bath with two hundred and nine. And how do you explain this disparity? Um, tough one, I think. But I was I was also asked if you if you are working and then regularly in, with Bath Spa and regularly in communication. Uh, Professor Morley. Yeah, we are. We work very closely with Bath Spa, and we've worked very closely with the local public health authority. They both myself and and the vice chancellor at Bath Spa sit on the outbreak engagement board with the 
Public Health and the RUH and the Council. Um, I have no explanation for that. We, we have three times as many students at, uh, at, at the university. Um, they probably come from, well, I know they come from further afield than the Bath Spa students, but beyond that, I'm not an epidemiologist and I wouldn't like to hazard a guess as to, as to why there is that disparity. There are all sorts of possible reasons and, and I don't have a simple explanation for it. Sorry. You could ask the Director of Public Health, he may have a, an explanation, but I doubt he would either. Pretty good. I think uh, that's uh, that's uh, the last, I think they're all comments in the chat box, so if anyone's got any further questions in there, uh, or is there anything, any, uh, any of the other panellists wanted to comment on some of the questions I didn't direct to you? Matt, I thought about the, the town and gown scenario. We have a number of, this is the top of my head here, we have a number of empty units in, in the centre of Bath. Maybe it could be an idea we could work with the university to put uh, their research projects on display in there and what, what the students are working on as a bit of an advertisement for what the university does in general. Uh, and people can go in and out of that. And, you know, it's, it's just an idea of how we can demonstrate to the people of Bath what the university is doing. It's just, just a suggestion. We could look at doing that. Sounds good. You've just, you've just reminded me to, to mention that um, I think it's worth reminding people about the enormous amount of work we put in over the over the lockdown, generating um, PPE for the RUH, because we made somewhere in the region of over 20,000 face shields for the RUH. We worked with Bath Spa on making gowns for the RUH. And uh, we've ended up with so many face shields that we distributed distributed them also to pharmacists and local GPs and care homes and we still have some left in case we need them again but there's a sort of I think we we did it quite a lot of work with the local community over that lockdown to try and use as Kevin said our research and our student union volunteers and everybody to actually uh, try and sort of support the community as, as best we possibly can because it is our community. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's quite important, Matt, that we get that message out there, really, uh, to, so people know the, the good job the university are doing. Yeah. I, I, it, it looks like we are still coming to, to, to the end of our conversation. I really want to um, thank um, each and every one of you um, again, Sue Adams, Bernie Morley, Councillor Kevin Guy, and been re really to hear from all of you um, and looking at the chat I mean you can see that people are very understanding some people are a little bit unhappy so um, I was a little bit concerned to hear um, from what I assume as a parent to say that she felt not particularly supported in in, in, in homeschooling and, and my advice would always be to go back to your school teacher and say that um, if we have been talking about communication I think we, we all play a part in good communication and um, some of that can be, of course, about criticizing because then that, that's a way of how we get better. Um, and, and to be, um, and I listened to um, Nicola Sturgeon, um, this, uh, about her message, that nobody responsible for, for this virus it came on us as, as humans on this planet in every country. Um, and, and we all um, are, are, are puzzled, shocked, frightened, um, uh, and we, we are trying to make the most of it. And, and her message was, and I, in, in many ways, I mean, it sounds maybe, maybe a little bit daft, and I hope I don't want to sound daft, but a lot of it is about understanding and being nice to each other. Um, and, and she even talked about love. Um, the, the, the thing that, that, that I think um, has been a positive thing coming out of, 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 of the crisis is that we have understood that uh, the community spirit is really one of the things that has been uh, very commendable and, and ha has been you know something that has kept us all going and I'd say um, we need to continue through very difficult months to to try and understand that it's been very difficult for everybody um, and yes um, we can criticize and I criticize the government and people can come to me and say Vera, maybe you haven't done enough here or there and everywhere or people can go to the university and say Hmm, have you really done enough or to a, a school and say have you really done enough and I I'd say everybody has to keep their ears and eyes open for things that we can do better but I'd also say 
we can we, we all need to learn um to, to to really understand in the round um the huge challenges for everybody and that is the young people understanding the old and isolated people um, um the older people understanding the younger people and understanding how how anxious they feel about the, their, their future parents understand the difficulties for teachers and teacher understanding the anxiety of parents so it is about listening um to each other um and, and that is my message for you tonight as well um, let, let's just continue to listen and, and keep the, the, the channels of communication open. One other thing that I want to say in, in, in terms of my anxiety of keeping the numbers down, I have been since the beginning of the pandemic talked about the importance of face coverings and I don't understand why this government hasn't made more of those. And I see also that it's become a bit of the culture wars if you're feeble, if you wear face covering. Face coverings are there to protect others from yourself. That message too, which is about me protecting others rather than thinking who protects me. Uh, of course, it also protects you in the end if everybody does it. But a, a much more widespread, and I say that to the student community as well, a much more widespread wearing of face coverings does save lives. There's clear evidence um, that it can spread um, reduce the risk of sp spreading the virus by 80%. So if I can say anything here, anybody can take responsibility of wherever possible to wear face coverings. And I know, of course, in schools, this is not, not possible. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and I can easily see young people messing around with face coverings and all the rest of it. But I also know that some um, schools have been putting their mind to that. But wherever we go, even outside, I think the, the more widespread wearing of face coverings I even see Jacob Rees-Mogg in Parliament now wearing a face covering, although they have all staunchly resisted wearing face coverings because it does make a difference. So please let's all look again of where we can possibly wear face coverings more widespread. And let's keep the communication going, but most of all, um, let's all work together uh, for the best outcome for our universities, our schools, our young people, our older people, our communities, and for, for, for the city of Bath together. Thank you very much for attending. Um, it's been uh, very interesting and, and I take some of the conversations also offline. Good night.